18 of the book of Revelation, first of all, I'll explain to you, it begins with the heavenly host singing hallelujah unto the Lord our God. Verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying hallelujah, salvation, and the glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord our God. Well, if you notice there in that verse, first of all, it says, after these things. Well, after what things? After the destruction of a religious and political Babylon. You remember the last two weeks? Chapter 17 and 18 were about the destruction of religious and political Babylon. Also, if you notice there, that the people are in heaven are singing and rejoicing. They're singing hallelujah. All right, they are rejoicing. Why? It's because as we go through this chapter, you'll notice that, first of all, evil has run its course. Secondly, the tribulation hour is ending. Thirdly, the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing to return with his saints. Fourthly, the armies of the world are about to be demolished through the battle of Armageddon. Fifth, the swords then will be made into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, Isaiah 2.4. And sixthly, of course, Jesus Christ will soon establish his millennial kingdom upon the earth. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So you see, the, re the reason that praise is directed to the Lord our God, who is, if you notice there, salvation, glory, honor, and power, as they're praising him, is answered in or revealed in the second verse. And if you look at verse 2 in the book of Revelation, the Word of God says, For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath, he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants uh, at her hand. Well, you, we all remember Revelation 17, don't we? What was that about? It was about the harlot church. And I recommend, my dear people, if you don't have it or if you have not heard that message, did you get that tape? Because you'll be thoroughly surprised at what the Lord shows us through his word. Well, you see, what's going on here is the judgments have been completed of the harlot church. In other words, the word, word of God here says, For the he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, meaning spiritual fornication, speaking of the harlot church. How many of you know <clears throat> that the Lord is coming back very, very, very quickly and he's coming back for a church without spots? or a wrinkle. He's coming back for a true church. He's not coming back uh, for a bride that, that's got a dirty dress. He's coming back for a, a, a bride that is uh, 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 not a harlot. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And we look here at verse 3, it says, And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And there's, in other words, their smoke rose up forever and ever is speaking of political Babylon. You all remember what, what the Lord showed us political Babylon was? In chapter 18, you better believe it, it's America. Make sure you get the tape. God's people in heaven acknowledge the fact that Babylon, Babylon's doom is eternal. Amen? Now we'll go to verse 4. It says, And the four and twenty elders... And the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. The twenty-four elders, my dear people, first of all, if you remember, represent the church. The twenty-four elders represent the church. You have the twelve apostles and the twelve tribes of Israel. Consequently, we get twenty-four. We observed the casting of their, their trophies or crowns at the feet of Jesus, calling the rapture of the church and the judgment seat of Christ, if you remember, in chapter 4. In chapter 4. The four beasts, if you remember, were identified as the cherubim and the seraphim, also in chapter 4. And they are there also worshiping God, if you'll notice there in verse 4. Now we'll go to verse 5. And the voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Well, my dear people, the voice is probably an angel encouraging the heavenly host to continue to the praise of our God. Amen? And if you notice here in verse 6, it says, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, 
and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunderings saying hallelujah for the Lord God opponent reigneth if you notice there my dear people as all heaven joins together in praise and worship the multitude of voices sound as many waters and mighty thunderings how many of you can recall right off the top of your head what it says in Matthew 6.10? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, listen to those words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. Heaven being our example. Did praise and worship God in heaven with the voices of a multitude. Did you notice that? That's our example. Praise and worship, if you notice, is continuous in heaven. God wants us to praise and worship Him on the earth as it is in heaven. And that's what He's bringing us into. My dear people, as, as the voices of the, of the, the roar of many waters and many thunderings. Then you notice here in verses 7 and 8, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Oh, my dear people, at the hour of Christ's return to earth with his bride, the church, the true church, in other words, the honeymoon is to begin the, for the thousand year millennial reign. How many of you know that as Christians right now, and you probably never looked at, at, at it this way before, how many of you know that we are the bride of Christ? How many of you know that on, during our walk on the earth we are engaged to Jesus? Have you ever thought about that before? We are His bride engaged to Him. We are engaged to Him. And consequently, uh, 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 because we are engaged to Jesus Christ, God commands that His church, the bride of Christ, be holy. Be holy. The Word of God says in 1 Peter 1.16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am am holy and my dear people our Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle and he's coming and he's blowing the winds of holiness throughout all the body of Christ and those that will take heed those that will take heed will begin to recognize and to walk in the holiness of the Lord Amen Hallelujah 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 if you turn with me quickly to Ephesians chapter 5 I show exactly what he's talking about here. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, this is where, in Ephesians 5, talks about husbands and wives. We've all read about that, haven't we? I've read it a lot. My wife keeps showing me where it's at. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, beginning in verse 25, the Word of God says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word. And he tells you why, verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. My dear people, Jesus Christ is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle, a holy church without blemish. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, For I am jealous over you. I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one Husband, that I may present you as a 
mature virgin to Jesus Christ. My dear people, every one of us at this very moment are engaged to Jesus Christ. We are engaged to Him while we are on the earth. And this is the reason why He says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We notice here, and go back to the book of Revelation. Excuse <laughs> me. The Word of God says in verse 9 of Revelation 19, And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Aren't you glad that you're born again tonight? Aren't you glad that you're invited to that supper? Aren't you glad that you're engaged to Jesus Christ tonight? You better believe it. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. My dear people, the bride is composed of all, and I say this, born again believers. Born again believers who have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why he said, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? Hallelujah. Then you notice there in verse 10 it says, And I fell at his feet to, to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The apostle John here was so caught up in the vision that the Lord was showing him. And I must say, I can't blame him. I would be too. But he was so caught up uh, with the vision uh, that he bowed his knee to an angel. He bowed his knee to an angel. And the angel cried out and he says, Don't do it. Get up. Because I'm only a servant of God, just as you are. Just uh, as you are. And my dear people, and I'm not knocking churches, but, but if you've if you got any friends that's in a Catholic church, tell them to put bow on her knee to Mary. Because you know what? She, she had to get saved just like you and me. You better believe it. She had to get saved just like you and me. And you know what? <clears throat> One thing I've learned about in these last few months, the last few years, I've gotten real bold. You know why? <clears throat> doesn't make any difference if you're nice. Does it? Huh? Now, what I mean by that? I'm, what I mean is I'm nice, yes, but I'm talking about you've got to be bold with the Word of God. You can't back up. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What was that? What verse? Ten? Eleven. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. John the Apostle sees heaven opened again. Did you notice I said again? Because the door in heaven is open twice in the book of Revelation. How many of you know that? Did you all know that? It's open twice. You better believe it. The first time is in Revelation 4.1. Revelation 4.1, which is the rapture of the church. You all remember that? The rapture of the church. And then again, the door opens again a second time, now in Revelation 19.11. We just read it. In order that the saints may return to the earth with the, revi- with the rider on the white horse, my dear people, King of kings and Lord of lords. How many of you know that there are two comings of Jesus Christ? There are two comings of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that? You all know that. There are two comings. First one is the rapture of the church, where we meet him in the clouds, where we meet him in the air. First Thessalonians 4.17. I'll show you here real quick. I want you to know this. I want you to know this. <clears throat> Hallelujah. First Thessalonians. Thank you, Jesus. Chapter 4. We'll begin with verse 16. My dear people, you need to know these things. You need to know these things. You need to go right to the Word and show these people. <clears throat> the prophetic talk clock is ticking. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, who? Us which are alive, which are alive. How many of you are here tonight are alive? Amen. Amen. We've got no dead ones tonight. Praise God for that. 
And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Who? The dead in Christ. The dead in Christ. In the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. You notice that? Underline that if you don't have it underlined. In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen? All right. That is the church. What church? The true church. The born-again church. The redeemed church. That is the true church. My dear people, there are many true churches the world over. But I'm going to tell you, my dear people, make sure you're in one of them. Make sure you're in the one of them. I hate to be bowing my knee to Mary or some idol somewhere when the Lord God give his shout because you ain't going to hear him. You've got to be tuned in to the Spirit. You better believe it. Hallelujah. And then, hallelujah. <coughs> hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Then the rapture of the church happens, the true church. The church is removed from the earth. We meet Christ in the air and we go to heaven. We go to the judgment seat of Christ. I won't minister about that tonight. Then what happens? The seven-year tribulation begins. The seven-year tribulation begins. Someone said to me the other day, well, I thought the world ends then. No, it doesn't end then. That's when the tribulation begins on the world for those that, that are not saved or unsaved. They ain't going to be anybody here. The church is gone. Hallelujah. Then when is the second coming? That was the first. The second coming is when his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives. Upon the Mount of Olives. And what happens... Uh, he comes down and his feet physically touch the earth right on the Mount of Olives. And you know what else? We're with him. Hallelujah. How do you know that? We are with him. Yeah. Uh, hallelujah. You better believe it. I'll show you that. Turn with me, please, to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. I'm going to show you a fulfillment of that. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, these churches better wake up. They better start preaching about the second coming because you know what? There's no time left for the rapture of the church. The time is run out. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 14. It's a, it's the second book. I think let me see here. It's a, it's the second book towards the front from the New Testament. Zechariah chapter 14. Everybody got it. Okay. Behold, <clears throat> beginning of verse one, and fourteen. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be di divided in the midst of thee. Verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now that's speaking of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon happens. That's the reason he comes. That is the second coming. Did you know that? That's what he's doing at the Mount of Olives. Keep reading. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day up on the Mount of Olives. You see that? Underline it. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's the second coming. Which is before Jerusalem on the east. And on the Mount of Olives shall cleave to the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall re remove toward the north, and half it toward the south. And ye, ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azale. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Look at that last sentence, my dear people. Glory be to God. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Hallelujah. You better believe it. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's us, people. That's us. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, I wonder, what I wanted to show you here is, uh, don't let, ever let anybody tell you that there's only one coming, or one appearing of Jesus Christ. There is two. There is two. There are two, the two doors opening in heaven that tell the truth. Now, we just saw the first door open in, in book of Revelation 19.11, didn't we? I'll say, okay. Now, go back to Revelation chapter 4. I'll show you the other door, just so you'll know. Revelation chapter 4. <coughs> Verse 
Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Everybody got it? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. The first two words spoken there says, After this, after what? After the Lord has dealt with the churches, which is the first three chapters in the book of Revelation. After this. In other words, after the Lord has dealt with the, with the, the, the seven churches in Asia. Okay. Because if you'll notice, he doesn't deal with the churches at all, all the way back, all the way until we get to verse 20 of Revelation. I believe it is. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened. That's the first opening of the door. That is the first coming. The, the door was opened in heaven, and I heard a voice which I heard as, as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Come up hither, and I will show you, I will show thee things which must be hereafter, speaking about the rapture. Come up hither. All right. So what you've got there is you can make a note of this, is you've got two doors opening in heaven. Revelation 4, 1 is the fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. You got it? Revelation 4, 1 is the fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And the second door that opens in Revelation 19, 11 is the fulfillment of Zechariah 14, 4. The first coming is the rapture of the church. The second coming is the battle of Armageddon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have I got it? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's go back to the Revelation, book of Revelation chapter 19. Verse 12. Hallelujah. If you notice there in verse 11, I forgot to tell you this, that I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. You see, that's Jesus Christ on that horse. And it says, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And the reason I'm pointing out to you is because there's a man that comes on another white horse in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. Do you remember him? Do you remember him? That was the Antichrist. You say, well, he's on a white horse too. Why isn't he on a white horse? Because he's acting like he was good when he was bad. How many of you know that Satan is a deceiver? You better believe it. Hallelujah. Satan is a deceiver. You say, how do you know he's a deceiver? If you read that verse, he's got no arrows for his bow. Huh. <laughs> he's been stripped of all weapons. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. <clears throat> you better believe it. Hallelujah. Verse 12. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, Father. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, speaking of Jesus. And he had a name written that no man knew, for he himself. But he himself. These are the same eyes, if you remember, that we saw in Revelation 1.14, the description of Jesus Christ. As king, and he has on his head the crowns of royalty. Amen? A lot of these things I don't go into depth like I did at first, because we've already covered them in the first tapes, you see. Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Glory. And his name is called the Word of God. What you've got there, and it says, and he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his... And first of all, that is a fulfillment of Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. I'll show this to you. If you'd like to turn there. Isaiah 63. Verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 63, verses 3 and 4. I have trodden the winepress alone. That's speaking of Armageddon. And of the people there was none with me. Because you see, he fights that battle alone. And you say, well, what do you mean? We were with there. But we didn't fight because he, Jesus spoke the word. Jesus spoke the word. We were just observing. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will, leave, I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Hallelujah. 
Aren't you glad you're redeemed tonight? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we'll go back to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Hallelujah. Verse 13 also says, and, his, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I never will forget when we very first came over here. It's been going on seven years now. But I never will forget when we first came over here, the Lord told me, I said, Lord, I don't have anybody to help me. And he says, I'll send, I'll send someone. Remember that? He says, and you'll know him by his name. You'll know him by his name. And I kept trying to look around at different people that I knew that was in the ministry and things like this. Well, someone's going to help us, Carol, and we will know him by his name. And you know, I kept racking my brains and trying to figure out what it was. And at about 3 o'clock in the morning... The Lord woke me up. How many of you ever had that happen before? Yeah. You better believe it. It's always 3 o'clock. You ever notice that? He woke me and I saw straight up in bed. And I just, you know, the Lord had something for me. I went into my little study and I looked down and opened the Word of God. And there it was, Revelation 19, 13. The Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. Oh, glory be to God. Amen? <laughs> Never will forget that. Verse 14. <coughs> And the armies uh, which were in heaven. You know what that says? Armies which were in heaven? The armies, that's us. Were in heaven. Followed him up on white horses. My dear people, you know what we got white horses? Oh, glory be to God. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Well, my dear people, at that moment, the Apostle John sees the Word of God coming in judgment. How many of you know that the Word of God has got the final authority? How many of you know that the Word of God is the final authority? You know what, my dear people? It doesn't make any difference what I believe. It doesn't make any difference what anybody else believes. It doesn't make any difference what you believe. It's what the Word of God says. It's what the Word of God says. Why? Because it is the final authority. And at this minute, the Apostle John sees the Word of God coming in judgment. Because you see, the Word of God is the final authority. This is what we're judged by. It's the Word of God. John also sees a great host called the armies which were in heaven following the Word. We all know who the Word is, don't we? Jesus Christ. Up on white horses. That army is the saints that were raptured in Revelation 4, 1. The bride of Christ. The born-again believer. The born-again church. The true church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are tens of thousands in number returning with the king for the battle of Armageddon. We just read that in Zechariah 14. Well, of course, that's where his feet touch down at the Mount of Olives, which is the second coming. Hallelujah. 14, verse 14 is the fulfillment of Jude 14 and 15. You turn with me to the book of Jude. The book of Jude is right in front of Revelation. It's about two pages. Thank you, Jesus. The book of Jude is about two pages and it's right in front of the book of Revelation. You're going to see us again in here. Verses 14 and 15, if you notice. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, 